So the topic is HIV, AIDS, and pain in general. So I'm just going to do a first of all a general overview, and then we'll go through it. Just keep in mind the reason why HIV AIDS patients end up with pain is 60 percent is the reason is by the viral infection, the immunosuppression that it, that it, uh, the virus itself causes. About 30 percent is because due to the treatment for the infection. And about 10 percent is due to other, co other reasons. But just realize that there are reasons why they end up with pain. As we know, this is the retrovirus, going back to micro. The background is, again, it's the retrovirus that contains the enzymes. We know this all. Just realize that it's, it part of, becomes the part of the DNA. And then there is two related retroviruses, viruses, H HIV-1 and HIV-2, which are clinically um, widespread throughout. The implications is the how vi uh, virulent they are. The HIV-1 is mainly found in Europe, Asia, Western Hemisphere, and these areas. The HIV-2 is ma mainly in Western Africa. And there are certain areas in Western Africa that have both as well. The HIV-1, uh, HIV-2 is less virulent compared to the 1. The endemic is basically is growing and stabilizing at the same time. The biggest factor that's growing is in the heterosexual population and in children. In um, about 2006, there have been 56,000, uh, a little more than 56,000 people infected newly. Worldwide, there is greater than 40 million people with HIV. There are deaths due to, you know, cirrhosis, cancer, and organ failure that this virus leads to. And the biggest factors that we're seeing the highest risks in women uh, in African Americans and Hispanic populations due to noncompliance. The basic vulnerability, as we know, this is a general knowledge, when your levels of CD4 levels fall less than 200 then the, you're predisposed to the opportunistic infections. The diagnosis, of course, as we know, is ELSA. And if that's positive, we go due to the more sensitive one, which is the Western Vault. <coughs> as we know, the prognosis, once you have HIV, you have HIV. Uh, and that can develop later on to AIDS. However, uh, it's no longer a prognosis that's a short-lived prognosis anymore with the new treatments and um, medical care. And if they're compliant, they can live up to 70 to 80, which I have a couple of 70 to 80-year-old HIV-positive patients. Of course, during the, the, the longer the, the life now that they're having, uh, the more tendency of seeing the pain symptoms, complications, and all the rest that comes with the disease itself. The neurological symptoms can be one of the most common presentations. And some of the manifestations can be CNS or peripheral. We have also, you can see, dementia related to HIV, uh, CNS manifestations, and the PML. 5% of the people with the HIV can develop PML. It's the infection of the brain. I don't need to read all of this, do I? You guys know it all. <laughs> the other ones are the myelopathies that can occur. It's basically slow progressing. And it can manifest with lower extremity stiffness and weakness, ataxia. The one thing that you have to note is that sometimes a patient will come to you, which happened to me when I first started in the beginning of my practice. A young guy comes in with, he was about 40, he was very young, well built, no other medical problems, no real thing, but had some kind of numbness, tingling, burning in his feet. 
That was the only reason why he showed up. And, as, and I kept on asking him, because it was unusual, he did not have any predisposing thing to have uh, some kind of a peripheral neuropathy, no diabetes history, nothing. No asthma, no you know, steroid usage, nothing that I can pinpoint. And I kept on asking him, are you sure you don't have HIV? And he would get really pissed off me. About, then he disappeared. Three years later, he shows up and he tells me, Doc, you were right. He didn't know that his partner was infected. So that neuropathy can be one of the clinical manifestations that can occur in the beginning without any, uh, without any signs. So some of the other stuff that we can see in the CNS involvement associated with the HIV pa uh, patient populations. Uh, of course, the, the dementia, tox toxoplasmosis, the lymphoma, the encephalitis, and it's many of them are related to the CD4 counts, and some are not. Of course, uh, this is just a continuation. You could have demyelinating polyneuropathies, you can have myelopathies, you can have leukoencephalopathies, and um, you can have distal symmetric polyneuropathy. And some of these are basically related to the CD4 count. And these are just some of the other manifestations uh, that are also associated with HIV viruses, uh, HIV virus infected patient population. Now, uh, the onset of the neuropathy can be days to weeks. It could be pain, it could be sensory or loss of, uh, or sensory loss or weakness, mild to moderate. It can be symmetric, it could be asymmetric. It could um, be related to 83% of the time, axonal loss. Oh, I think we went through this one. The most common one that we see that are more severe or more complex is when the CD4 counts uh, go down below 100. And that you could see as mononeuropathies. And then the biggest one that we worry about is quad equina syndrome, which is more serious because it can lead to many other problems with facet para, para, paraplegia, and, you know, urinary incontinence things that can happen. Now, you also have oral manifestations related. You have thrush, you have uh, leukoplechia. Some are painful, some are not. It can uh, affect your, uh, the nutritional status. It could, um, some are, you know, they just might not even realize they have any problems. The other biggest problem is herpes simplex. So you can have herpes zoster could be very severe and painful with these patients. In fact, I have one when they have an outbreak, that it can be very uh, intense, very widespread. Um, and what do we do if they have post neuralgia? We could do Quintenza, and it does work. I have one patient who just got approval, I think Friday you might see him. It's, um, he had an outbreak of a zoster, in the chest on the left side, basically from the top of the shoulder all the way down to the end of the um, sternum. And that whole left side is good. But he does well with Quintenza, which lets him, gives him pain-free symptoms for about a year for him. These are the general cardiopulmonary manifestations that can be associated, can be seen. Doesn't mean it's going to be. The main one problem that is seen is the lipodystrophy syndrome, which is seen a, uh, a lot in uh, the HIV patients. And I'll go through that a little later in the slides, um, especially associated with certain antiviral medications. The other issue is they can have developed diabetes or glucose intolerance, uh, either due to the, to the virus itself or to the treatment that they're receiving. And these are uh, studies that have shown that they also, uh, why they develop it, most closely related to the PI tr use of protein inhi inhi uh, inhibitor. 
another one. I'm just going through them. So what is lipodystrophy? It's the redistribution of fat that can accumulate in other areas that normally doesn't occur. And main presentation is a big distended abdomen. It develops on the waistlines and it causes a lot of risk factors. And most important, besides it causing a lot of medical risk factors for diabetes, coronary artery disease, and um, the psychosocial aspect of having big deposition, like a big beer belly all of a sudden. They're skinny in the arms and the legs and they have this big protruding belly. That is really, they found that it sometimes can be related to the to the uh, treatment in itself. And the way they do it, tries, tries, they try to do is change the medications, see if that might help reduce it. They found that if you exercise, it might reduce it a little bit. Um, but that is a big problem. And that could also lead, uh, lead to noncompliance of the patients uh, if they're developing. I have a big picture for it. This is a very big issue. When I was going to the clinic over here in Peter Kruger, this is a very big issue. People want to feel skinny and that skinny is issue when all of a sudden they're still developing a big stomach and abdomen and they're thin in the legs and the arms, nowhere else it's depositing. It becomes a big psychological issue for them. There's also hematological disorders. I'm going to go spin right through some of these, okay? And as we know, as they progress, they can develop into AIDS. And some of the uh, side effects of some of these medication, ACT, uh, usually cause proximal weakness, lead to pain. All right, I'm just going to go right through. Now, common types of pain. 26% basically develop abdominal pain. There is roughly 25% will uh, develop peripheral neuropathy type of pain. Uh, roughly around 20% you might see throat pain. About 63% can have headaches. Not migraine headaches, but more tension headaches uh, in this population. But what we see right now is more in the, in the clinic is the peripheral neuropathy type of pain. And you don't see more, they don't really come too much with abdominal pain to us, but more, and they come with low back pain. But the peripheral neuropathy, as we know, it's a numbness, tingling, and burning. It's the nerve damage caused by not only the virus itself, but the treatment for the virus as well. Uh, the abdominal pain is also possible as a, again side effects due to the medication for it the virus itself and sometimes people take the virus antivirals and they drink lead to pancreatitis lead to inflammatory issues you know they develop many side effects so the abdominal pain is also very commonly seen among them headaches um, it's more common to have tension type of headaches than migraine type of headaches. It's uh, more of a pressure throbbing dull type of headache than your typical migraine. But they can also have to also uh, worry about brain issue, involvement of the brain, do they have stroke, do they have lymphoma, etc. The other pains are also the joint pains, bone pains, herpes pains we went through. Now the treatment's what's important. Opioid treatment, your regular start from Tylenol down, your narcotic treatments, your topical treatments. Our usual gambit of, of stuff that we offer these patients on the treatments. The problem, uh, and injections, of course. We do injections on the HIV. The one thing I want you to remember, if you're gonna inject anybody with, a, uh, with steroids, whether you're gonna do an epidural, a nerve block, any kind of injection, you should always take into account what are their CD4 count is. Uh, my uh, general limit 
for doing any kind of injection is a CD4 count of 400. If they have a CD4 count of uh, 400, I will inject, but if it's any less than 400, I will not because the risk of infection increases. The risk of causing steroid myopathy increases. Now, these patients are prone to also myopathy. If you steroid inject them three in a row, two weeks apart, they're fine. But if you do more than that and you don't give a break, you will see myopathy. You can see cushionoid. Their faces will spell, swell up. They will become like a cushionoid appearance. It can happen. So just be aware. Also, the steroid decreases the CD4 count. So let's say they started at 400 or they were a little below and you did ended up uh, injecting them. Every injection can decrease their CD4 count. Just be aware and just document on how you're doing them and how much what you're giving to them because it has implications. So that's why when I do patients, in fact, you'll see one patient, she's becoming a little bit cushionoid and so we have to give a break for her. Now these are the treatments uh, for the general uh, heart therapy uh, that they start. When they, they start, the general rule of thumb is 500 below. Of course, if they developed any kind of uh, opportunistic infections, even if they have levels that are higher, then they would also be started on <coughs> antiviral treatments. Um, the treatments that are, we, uh, that are out there is the NRT ones, which are the generic names and the brand names, these are one of them. Then there is also the non-nucleoside analog reverse transcriptase inhibitors. These are also. Then they have the proteinase inhibitors, which remember they can increase lipids within 48 weeks. These are very commonly associated with the lipodystrophy syndrome. Then a lot of people end up with dual therapy, triple therapy. Remember, the regime itself is very hard to swallow. A lot of patients who take these medications have a lot of GI upset. Uh, they have a lot of nausea associated with them as well. It's cumbersome for them. Some just don't want to take it. And of course, the toxicities with the neural uh, side effects of these medications. We went through them all before. The most important is that they can end up leading to the neuro peripheral neuropathy, the abdominal pain, the low back pain that will end up at your door. But just remember why they have the pain. It's not because of anything else, but they truly have reasons to have the pain. Because of these medications and the medical care, they're living longer. And then we're seeing the side effects and complications of them living longer. And that's a very common presentation of a, of a lipodystrophy. It's thin and they have the protruding abdomen. Of course, there's new uh, treatments coming out for them and also when a vaccine has been just approved for human trials. Um, I don't know who's going to do that, but a hu uh, it's been there. Just remember, once they have HIV, they will have HIV for the rest of their lives. They can lead into AIDS. And that's because of the HIV, the virus itself, as I said, 60% will develop pain because of the virus. 30% will develop pain issues due to the treatment. Then there's 10% for other reasons. Any questions? It's a quick overview. Back to school. Let's go back to school. All right, sickle cell. As we know, it's a genetic disorder. If we didn't know by now, it's uh, common among uh, and about in the United States, about 75,000 are infected. It probably is more by now. Um, it's, as we know, is a result of a mutation of the beta globin. And 
it's most common in eight to, eight to ten percent in the African American population as a sickle cell trait, and about zero zero three percent to zero point one five percent have the sickle cell anemia. Fifty percent of those with the sickle cell anemia die before the age of twenty, and most of the others can live all the way up to forty. But Remember, sickle cell anemia is also common in parts of Africa, in Spanish-speaking areas like South America, Cuba, the Caribbean, Central America, Saudi Arabia, India, in the Mediterranean like Turkey, Greece, and Italy. So it's not just a confinement to the African-American population. It is seen in worldwide areas as well. It's, as we know, the trait is the recessive when you have both SS and the, um, I'm sorry, the disease is at the SS and the trait is the AS. So basically, if they have the trait and they end up in the emergency room saying they have a crisis but they have a trait, suspect <laughs> because they usually <laughs> don't have symptoms okay they live normal lives well, you offer the pump anyway. yes you offer them the pump and you give them some Dilaudid you make sure you give them lots of Percocet to go home with make sure you have the Percocet to go home with okay but the anemia ones now with good treatments can live for a while and they can have a fairly healthy life. They can live up to 40 to 50 years, some of them longer. Unfortunately, I had a, uh, a sickle cell anemia patient who died around, it was about 32. But he lived okay up to 32. Uh, but it's, it is a deadly illness, but it's the ones with the full-blown recessive trait the anemia, not the, ki uh, not the AS, but the SS ones. The ones or the trait do not have these issues. The one with the anemia have the issues. The, so the basically to, you know, our basic principle, you avoid, they should avoid dehydration, they should avoid high altitudes, they should avoid stress situations. They should avoid going to the emergency room. That's the key. If they could come to the medical doctor or to their pain doctor or whoever, they should get more better care as an outpatient and a steadier care that way than ending up in the emergency constantly. However, saying that, they do end up in the emergency room a lot. Okay, so basically what it does it that uh, happens in the sickle cells? We have increase in viscosity, you have reduced blood flow, you have vascular occlusions can occur, and therefore leads to even more sickling. So hydration is very important with these patients. They should all cost be constantly drinking, and especially in hot weather in the summer, they should not you know, avoid being so sweaty, they should constantly be drinking. The signs, of course, is the typical pain crisis, and they have the acute chest pain syndrome, the vascular accidents that occur, the chronic anemia, the infections. All of these are symptoms that can happen. And most of them end up with renal dysfunction because it, the renal, the kidneys start to fail because of occlusions that do occur. They end up with leg ulcers, organomelic, cardiac failures and of course abdominal and bone pains and they can end up with aseptic necrosis as well. These are the further on. The basic types of pains they do present with is nociceptive pain which, uh, and then neuropathic pain also. So they can have reasons for pain that are periodic. And remember one thing. Pain occurs because of blocked blood and low oxygen. And it's a painful uh, event. Crisis can occur any part of the body. That crisis could happen in the abdomen, they end up with abdominal pain. It can happen in the bone, they'll have bony pain. It can happen in the arm, anywhere in the body. There are patients who will have less than once a year crisis. And there are ones who will end up 15 or more crises per year. The crisis can be, is usually a acute, sudden, it'll happen quickly, and they could have ones that are chronic, 
or a mixture. The acute form is a mild to very severe and it can last from hours to days. If they have complications or they're not really treated properly, it can last for weeks. The chronic form is something that lasts for about three to six months or longer, which can cause severe limitations in their activity levels. And some people just have a combination of both. The, the severity of the disease can, you can look it up as laboratory findings with decreased hemoglobin, decreased hemoglobin F, the increased hemocrat, the increased white blood cells, and all the complication can be related to all of these findings. Now managing, that's what you want to know. Managing the crisis. High doses of folic acid as we know, analgesia for the pain, and hydration. The biggest thing is if they're going to have general anesthesia, they should not have general anesthesia if they have a hemoglobin below 10. They should also uh, worry about nitrous ox uh, oxide exposure. They should avoid barbiturates. Should really avoid strong narcotics, but they don't. <laughs> so, um, the value. But seeing all of this in mind, if the way to prevent them from going to the emergency room constantly and really to reduce their level of crises is really getting them on some of these people, some of these patients on a long acting. And long acting, if they have good pain control all the time, they tend not to go to the emergency rooms. They tend to have less crises they tend to do better than ending up in the emergency room getting IVPCs or getting a constant medication or coming into the hospital as an inpatient for a couple of days and getting the same thing and going out again. So remember, salicylates should be avoided and with, uh, with these patients if they're in a crisis because of the acidic effect. Opioids that can be helpful, and, the, and um, Dr. Shayova did a couple of studies, and she, had, she was big into the study of pain with sickle cell and uh, disease anemia patients, and finding that if you can give them continuous long-acting opioids, mainly fentanyl patches, that you can reduce their number of crises, and you can reduce the number that the, of, of visits to the emergency room Therefore, they can have a little more productive life, span a more little productive life and maintain a job instead of constantly being in the hospital. We're done.